What's up everyone and welcome to another episode on the corner. Today we're talking about lava tubes. Well, actually they're really lava tunnels and their scientific term is pyroducts, but we'll get into that in just a bit. So for those of you who don't know, I am a professional geologist and more specifically a geochemist and a paleoclimatologist. My current research is studying ice deposits from lava tubes at El Mapa East National Monument in New Mexico. Definitely check out some of my other vids if you are more curious about what I do. But today, we're focusing on just one specific thing, and that is lava tubes. Well, pyroducts. So, what exactly are lava tubes? Well, honestly, that's something that most volcanologists can't even answer to be completely honest. There is actually a huge misconception about what pyroducts really are and how they form. So before we actually define them, I want to give you the history of how the definitions have evolved. In 1752, the Icelandic explorer Egert Olafsson voyaged to Hawaii and became the first person to describe a lava tube. He described it as, the running lava flowed through this channel like a river. Then in 1772, Swedish explorers Dr. Uno von Troil and Daniel Solander, along with English botanist Sir Joseph Banks, also voyaged to Hawaii, where they provided a more in-depth description of these lava tunnels. They said, the upper crust sometimes cools and solidifies, even though the molten matter keeps running underneath. In this way, large caves form the walls, floors, and ceiling, of which are composed of lava and where a lot of dripstones occur. Titus Cohen, a Christian missionary, was then sent to Hawaiian islands by the church to convert the locals. However, while he was there, he ascended Mauna Loa and became the first person to report seeing an active tunnel. He went on to describe, but we soon had ocular demonstration of what was the state beneath us, for in passing along we came to an opening in the superincumbent stratum of 20 yards long and 10 yards wide, through which we looked, and at the depth of 50 feet we saw a vast tunnel of subterranean canal, lined with smooth vitrified matter, and forming the channel of a river of fire, which swept down the steep side of the mountain with amazing velocity. The sight of this covered aqueduct, or I may be allowed to coin a word, this pyroduct, Tied with mineral fusion and flowing under our feet at the rate of 20 miles an hour was truly startling. And yes, the scientific term for this phenomenon comes from a Christian missionary that was scared shitless he was about to be engulfed by a river of lava. So why isn't pyroduct commonly used and what's wrong with saying lava tube? Well, famous geologists like James Donna continued to use the term tunnel after their first discoveries. And guys like J.W. Powell, who was an absolute badass, by the way, coined their own terms like volcanic pipes. Tom Jagger was the first one to label it as a tube, and since 1940, it is the term that has stuck. But the term gives the wrong impression. See, tubes invoke an image of pipes in which lava can flow up and down under pressure like a plumbing system. It also implies these chambers are circular both of which are not the case. Furthermore, the usage of all these different terms has led to major misconceptions throughout the volcanologic community. In fact, in 1987, Ronald Greeley, who was a superstar planetary scientist and an amazing person, tried to distinguish the difference between a lava tube and a lava tunnel, even though they're literally the same thing. He went on to say, the term lava tube may be defined as the conduit beneath the surface of solidified lava through which molten lava flows. Lava channels, however, contain non-roof rivers of lava that frequently develop surface crust. Many, if not most, lava tubes develop from the roofing of channels. The distinction between channels and tubes is made in regard to the roof crust. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. And the ending of Greeley's quote transitions us into the next segment of this video. How exactly do these paradox form then? Well, let's ask the Encyclopedia of Volcanoes that was, this, that was published in 2002 and is used by many professors in their classrooms. It says, a lava tube is a lava channel that is partly or completely roofed over to enclose the lava stream and may form a cave after the lava has cooled. Uh, try again. Honestly, I don't really understand what the heck they're talking about. May form a cave? Bruh, it is a cave. And you're probably going, okay, Mr. Smarty Pants, how do they form then? 
Well, as of right now, and from what we know, there are two types of formations, inflationary and crusting over roofs. The inflationary formation is a process that is incremental, and it starts at the distal tips of the Bahoehoe flows where hot lava rapidly covers the ground in thin sheets. Now I'm sure you're asking yourself, what? Did he just say Bahoehoe? What the heck is that? And fair enough. So I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a quick volcanology crash course. So when a volcano erupts, you either get an explosive eruption or effusive eruption. In an explosive eruption, you'll have a giant bomb-like pieces shooting out of it with giant clouds of ash and dust spreading everywhere. A great example would be Mount St. Helens in 1980, or Krakatoa in 1883. Now, in an effusive uh, eruption, this is where you'll see the oozing lava flowing in river-like manners. In fact, just earlier this year, I'm going to do my best to pronounce this, Fragatus Fjall, I think, yeah, it's Icelandic, Fragatus Fjall erupted and its lava flows were broadcasted all throughout the world live for many days. Now, in effusive eruptions, you can get what we call basaltic lava flows. Now, basalt is just a type of igneous rock that is black and very rich in magnesium and iron. Now, there are three types of basaltic lava flows, Aa, Bahoehoe, and Pillows. Pillows of basalt are results of submarine volcanic vents and are seen at an ocean floor, or once where an ocean floor was. Aa flows are like glaciers. They're showing giant blocky rocks downhill in their entire width, and it's just a complete mess. It's it, Now, Pahoehoe flows are stationary and only grow from their tip. Now, because of the violence from these Aa flows and the smoothness of Pahoehoe flows, pyroducts only form from Bahoehoe flows. Okay, whew. congratulations on getting a semester's worth of volcanology in just a minute or so. Now, back to the formation of lava tubes. So remember, we have the inflationary mode and the crusting over roof mode. So in the inflationary mode, the tunnels are being excavated right at the tips of the Bahoehoe flow, where this hot lava is quickly moving across the ground. Now, because of the Bahoehoe flow itself is really thin, the lava cools quite quickly, which causes the dissolved gases in the lava to form bubbles, lowering the density of the cooled rock in comparison to the actively flowing lava. Now, we have this cooled sheet of igneous rock. Well, the eruption is still active, and thus more lava is going to make its way toward our now cooled sheet. Now, thanks to buoyancy, we know that lighter objects float on heavy objects. The cooled sheet is lighter than the molten lava. So, as the next pulse of advancing lava reaches our cooled sheet, the lava lifts the sheet up and continues on. Eventually, this molten lava will cool into its own thin sheet, and the next wave of molten lava will now raise this new sheet up and the initial sheet as well. If the area is covered by the first advance is flat, then many small and parallel tunnels can develop. But this process of advance, inflation, advance, inflation, etc. continues on until the eruption itself stops and the lava ends up running out of space and cools off at the end of the tunnel. Now, this brings up an important point. According to Steno's Laws of Stratigraphy, superposition states that naturally younger layers are deposited on top of older layers. Well, Steno, pyroducts are here to ruin your day. The chronostratigraphic data of Pyroduct shows that the oldest layer is at the top. In fact, this is kind of how we discovered the inflationary mode altogether and how most of these lava flows form. Now, there's really a fascinating process that occurs with volcanoes. They have an eruption cycle. Yes, most volcanoes aren't one and dones, unlike me. So what happens when a lava flow occurs and there's already a Pyroduct there? Well, we get a process known as back-cutting lava, lava falls. This is where flowing lava enters an already existing pyroduct. Now, it is important to note that very rarely is the ground in pyroducts completely flat. It is typically covered with rock debris from ceiling collapses. These ceiling collapses create large official openings known as pukas. You can have a hot puka when there is lava still flowing through the pyroduct, or a cold puka when there isn't lava flowing at all. But the debris that is deposited within the cave can make the terrain quite rocky with large drops. So when an existing pyroduct is then reflooded with lava, the lava can end up falling from these large drops, creating the equivalent of a waterfall, but with lava. 
And yeah, that's why we call it a lava fall. Now, these lava falls actually hammer out the rubble on the floor below, and because the lava is denser than the cooled rocks, the cooled rocks are then transported to the surface of this lava river. And then looking from this diagram, the lava is able to cut into the older cooled lava backwards while making the cooled rock float to the top, mixing with the colder air coming in from the puka, and thus creating a second ceiling or an, and a lower level tunnel. So this is how you have pyroducts with secondary or even tertiary tunnels. So then how did the crusting over of roofs work exactly? Well, there's two types. There's closure by log jam, which is where slabs, blocks, lava balls, and secondary class of already solidified lava form log jams, meaning highly porous and not very stable blockage on the surface of a channelized lava flow, and then it is injected by molten lava. The other is closure by lateral shelf growth, which this needs a calm and steady lava flow and is therefore operating in the formation of secondary roofs inside the down cutting pirate up, and not so much in the formation of primary roofs. And as I previously mentioned, most prior ducts form via the inflationary model. The crusting over roof model is not nearly as popular. But with this information, I want to now transition into the different types of prior duct systems that we observe. So the most common is the single trunk system. Here the lava is fed by one eruption vent and the tunnel size depends on the lava discharge rate and on the length of activity time. Now, if the eruption stops or the tunnel collapses and blocks the lava flow, the tunnel itself will then cool. So then the next case, the next, or in this case of the block tunnel, the same eruption will create a new pyroduct altogether. The next type of system is known as the double trunk system. This one is comprised of two lava tunnels active side by side at the same time, but are fed by two separate eruptions. And then finally, the least common and understood system is the superimposed trunk system. This is a set of lava tunnels superimposing and crossing each other out, all being active at the same time. The upper tunnels will stop their activity first, while the lower ones carry on for some time before eventually stopping and becoming empty. So now I want to shift gears and focus on the actual features inside these tunnels. What are the things you tend to find and why slash how did they get there? So first and foremost, obviously you will find a large abundance of igneous rocks and minerals inside these caves. But sometimes things happen to these rocks and turn them into things that are quite surprising. Fun fact, the inside of these pyroducts are absolutely freezing. Well, technically they're mostly below freezing actually, but why? Well, pyroducts aren't like most caves where you can easily just walk through an opening and walk down into the cave. They have unique entrances that require rigging explorers down into them. But think about this in terms of air currents. Remember, hot air rises and cold air falls. So let's take a look at this diagram. The blue air represents cold air while the red arrows represent warm air. Notice how the warm air can't enter the passageway since it's too heavy and the cold air blocks it off. So when water is transported into the pyroduct, it is met with freezing air and will eventually form ice. Most of this ice never melts. It just continues to accumulate over and over and over. We call this perennial ice. Now think about how this can affect the minerals inside the pyroduct. We know that there are a bunch of igneous minerals just hanging out inside, and water is the driving factor in chemical weathering, essentially where we break down the chemical bonds of rocks and minerals. Now remember that pyroducts only form from pahoehoe flows, which is a basaltic flow. Now, basalt is a mafic extrusive rock, meaning it is a silicate rich in magnesium and iron. Most of these minerals are like olivine, which is a magnesium iron silicate, pyroxenes are calcium or sodium magnesium iron silicate, and amphiboles, which is a silicate hydroxide. Now, water likes to go in there and break those bonds down and actually form new minerals. There's typically a plethora of opal formations, which opal is a hydrated silicate, and these formations are all along the walls. Pyroducts also typically have speleothems, and you know those as stalactites and stalagmites, and these speleothems are made of calcite that are formed from the bicarbonate ions in the water with the calcium ions in the weathered down pyroxenes and, amph and amphiboles. So some caves even have gypsum sheets. Now, gypsum is a calcium sulfate that's hydrated. So from the sulfide gases that were released by the steam in the flowing lava mixing with the calcium ions in the pyroxenes and amphiboles as they're weathered and the water flowing in, you can have these long gypsum sheets right at the entrances of some of these caves. 
Now, another really cool feature is the blood red walls that a lot of pyroducts contain. Now, these red walls are not hotter than the typical black walls, but instead are a result of the iron from the basaltic flow becoming oxidized to hematite, which is ferric oxide. Also, these tunnels have their own ecosystems. We are all familiar with bats and how they love caves, so to them, a pyroduct is just another home. But the guano, or the poop, of these bats leave behind are great sources for microbial life to form, and not to mention the microbes that are living within the ice. But I think the bigger question that brought you here is the, why study lava tubes? And odds are you're here because of the fact that we have discovered pyroducts on the moon, Venus, and Mars. And it turns out any terrestrial body that experienced some form of volcanism has pyroducts. Even Saturn's moon of Io has been spotted with them. And yes, these are very critical to our survival on other worlds. Since all the pyroducts here have ice deposits, they are on the I want you list by NASA. It's no secret that places like Mars were just like Earth, with flowing rivers and water aplenty. And I can confidently say, just like all of the geologists at NASA, that the pyroducts on Mars are littered with ice inside, probably enough ice to support a colony for a few years. Also, pyroducts are underground. This protects us from the deadly solar rays and radiation constantly bombarding the surfaces of the moon and Mars. We are destined to make these features our future home. But surprisingly, we still know so little about them. This is just the beginning of our understanding journey for future exocolonists' home. And of course, I'm willing to bet that if there is life on other worlds, the ice inside these tunnels is probably a great place to start looking.